Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. We are starting the webinar introduction to IPv6. The speaker are Alejandro Acosta and Sergio Rojas of LACNIC, who talk to us about different IPv6 topics for approximately uh, 50 minutes. The, um, the organization of this, this webinar is uh, described uh, on the screen. After this brief introduction, uh, the, the presentation will begin. Um, this webinar will be recorded and the attendees can ask questions accessing to the question and answer section at the bottom of the screen. And the, at the end of the presentation, we'll be reading the question for the first to answer. So with uh, nothing more, we welcome to speakers. Sergio, Alejandro, welcome. Please. Okay, um, as Mariela mentioned, my name is Sergio Rojas. I'm working at LACNIC in the Registration Services Department. Um, in this area, we are the responsible to administer and distribute internet number of sources for Latin America and the Caribbean region. And um, well, when I say internet number of sources, I'm talking about IPv6, IPv4, and AS numbers. And before to start the um, IPv6 um, basics training uh, conducted by um, Alejandro, well, I'm going to talk or I'm going to share with you my presentation. And my presentation is divided into two sections. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about IPv4 exhaustion. Um, we're talking, we will talk about um, the current policy, um, some report about the status of available um, IPv4 spacing in our region, and then how to request um, an IPv6 range to, to LACNIC. Well, um, as you probably know, we are one of the five RIRs, I mean, Regional Internet Registry around the world. Um, we administer uh, internet number of sources in this area. We are covering exactly 33 countries from Mexico to um, Central America, some island in the Caribbean and South America as well. And even some Southern Island like Falkland Island, Malvinas Island, or South Sandwich Island. And in total, we are covering 33 countries in this region. Currently, all organizations that receive IPv4, or IPv6 directly from LACNIC are members of LACNIC. So right now we have more than 9,000 members. Um, and as I mentioned, as we are responsible for distribution of IPv4 in this region, we are managing a little bit more than 10 slash eight that is kind of uh, almost 170,000 IP addresses. Well, we're going to talk about the exhaustion policy. And policy or the policy manual um, basically um, are created by the community. So you guys are responsible for creating this policy. And basically, like need, what, what is uh, our responsibility is to implement this policy. And of those pool of IPv4 that we had in the past, the community uh, decided to as exhaust this protocol um, and not rapidly, not quickly. So this is why some many years ago, a uh, community uh, proposed uh, how we are going to exhaust this, uh, this protocol. And so at that moment, if, if I'm not wrong, um, the proposal say when there are almost, yeah, five, six, six um, million or, or five point some, something uh, million IP addresses, um, we are going to start the soft landing policy. And this policy basically uh, have a, a rule how we are going to distribute these, uh, the remaining space in, in the region. So basically nowadays, um, the minimum allocation, well, before of that, um, we started this uh, phase three in February of 2017. And at that moment, 
well, from that moment, uh, the minimum allocation that the organization can receive is last 24, and the maximum is last 22. Um, and the available space will be um, distributed or allocated only to new entrants. I mean, organizations that already received IPv4 from Lagnik cannot request an additional uh, IPv4 range. So, um, another rule that this policy said is that all return and revoke space will be allocated in this phase as well, but just after allocating all, let's say, clean space. I mean, the, the IP addresses that were available in our pool that never um, be allocated to other organizations in the past. So um, when we finish this space, we're going to start um, allocating return and revoke space in the same phase, in this phase, right? At the end of this phase. Um, the amount of IP addresses reserved for the phase three um, reach um, 5.4 million IP addresses. And nowadays we have 1.7 million available space. And in this chart, you can see how we distribute these resources. For example, um, the blue section, that is 62%, were allocated to internet providers. And the red one, the red section, that is, let me see, 2.6% were allocated to end user. When when I say, when we say end users, it doesn't mean that the allocation were made to residential customers or corporate customers. We um, recognize organization in two different, yeah, two, different kind of organization. And basically, um, internet provider are all organizations that need IP address, addresses to reallocate to third. So internet provider has residential customers, corporate customer, uh, for example, VPS services or web hosting services, they need IP addresses to reallocate to other organization in order to um, work their business. So basically, ISPs need IP addresses to allocate to third. And when I say, or when we say end users recognize um, like um, universities, banks, um, government, organization that, that are going to use internet resources only for their own infrastructure, not reallocated to third. For example, an uh, internet exchange point, for example, they need only for the infrastructure and they don't need to reallocate to a third. So 2.6% were allocated to end user. Just to be, uh, to know what is the difference between ISPs and end users. Well, the, sec the yellow um, section that is 10.6%, um, well, that is 1.7 million IP addresses. This is available space. Uh, nowadays, and at 21% uh, is uh, the revoke and return space. So as I mentioned, as I mentioned, when we finish the yellow one, that is that represent 10% of, of the value space, we are going to start allocating from the return and recover space. And the last one, the purple section, that is part of this phase as well, but we, uh, by policy, we have fast slash um, 16 reserved for green infrastructure. I mean, after when we've finished all the um, available space, this is um, slash 15 will be reserved only for um, IXPs or CCTLDs or even if our RIR or, or if Lagnik needs, for example, more space, um, we can allocate to those organizations who need um, and it's considered as a critical infrastructure. Well, if you need more information about uh, measurement, um, there is a link. So um, this presentation will be available after the presentation, after the webinar, will be available in our website. So you can download and click on this link in order to, to, to see more information about allocation. Uh, even we have some measurement how the amount of IP addresses that we allocated quarterly.
Well, let's move to the other slide. Well, so as I mentioned, we have 1.7 million IP addresses available in total. And according to the behavior of the allocation since on January of 2018 up to now, we estimate, well, this is not just linear um, projection, um, but we estimate that the available space uh, we will be exhausted at the end of 2020, kind of October, November of 2020. And so this is uh, all from my from my first section of, of, of the presentation. Now we are going to move to the how to request IPv6 range to LACNIC. Um, it's true that if you didn't receive before, you you you, you can apply um, to receive. But we are we will not talk about how to request v4. But just to let you know, if you request v6, you can request v4 as well. And well, the procedure is very easy. Um, um, basically, you have to um, take into account that if there is two possibility and the requirement is not so um difficult so hard to meet so uh, the policy is not so restrictive to receive an ipv6 range so if our organization have received an ipv6 ipv4 from lagnic but not v6 yet so you can log into the request system that is request.lagnet.net user user id your admin user id and log into the system and there you will find the the form to request an ipv6 range if you if your organization didn't receive any resources from lagnet this is the first time that you that you are going to request internet number resources to lagnet first of all you have to create your user id clicking on this link, milagnic.net.lagnic. You can get there and click on new ID and then complete the form with your personal information. We, um, uh, we encourage people to use, um, to not use um, free email um, address like uh, Gmail, Hotmail. We insist to, to register your user using using your um, corporate domain name, uh, in that way will be easy to um, get more information about your organization. We can visit your website, know more about about your organization. And so, take care when you register your your user ID and try to use your um, corporate email and not not um, your personal email or your email or your free email account like Gmail, Google, or, or Yahoo. Well, once you get your user ID, return to the uh, request system, request.net, and authenticate using your user ID because it's, the system are going to um, define a user ID. So in this case, for example, um, my user ID or the user ID that we use for training is, is SRA, and and remember, if you already receive um, resources from LACNIC, use um, your user ID and you can choose from this list the organization that you are contact and then click on select. If, you, if, if it is the first time that you are requesting uh, resources to LACNIC, then click on create new organization and fill the form with the information of your organization. Here, this is very important um, item that you have to take care. Um, as I mentioned, we recognize your organization as an internet provider or end user. Just ask this question to yourself, right? If you are going to use the resources to allocate to third, so you are considered as an as a ISP. If you are going to use internet number of services only for your own infrastructure, not relocating to third, like universities, banks. Uh, you, uh, you can, uh, you have to choose uh, end user profile. Well, once complete the form, then 
then in the following um, screen, you will see the different type of requests that you can do. We are going to focus on only v6, right? Because this is the presentation. So choose here, um, request an IPv6 block as an internet provider or as an end user. And well, in the following screen, you will see this, uh, this form. Basically, you have to uh, complete um, with the required information. Some of them are mandatory, some of them not. Um, you have to declare uh, to which internet provider you are connected. Remember, well, that for end user, the minimum location is slash 40A and the maximum location is slash 32. So, um, maybe I can give you some clue to complete the form, but not talking about so technical topics because uh, this is a IPv6 basic um, uh, tutorial. But well, anyway, um, at the right side, you can see the help sign. So then you can, you can click there and you will get more information what kind of organ, what kind of um, information you have to fill in this field? Um, for example, in utilization plan, a basic utilization utilization plan is usually um, during the first uh, for internet provider. For example, during the first two months, we are going to make some tests and then configure the router, and then we are going to configure uh, v6 to to incorporate and then at the end of, of six um, um, months, we're going to configure in residential um, customers. This is a, a, a utilization plan or even utilization plan can be um, the routing plan, for example, how, what's the plan to, how you are going to announce the, uh, the IPv6 range to the internet, let's say a slash, um, 48 to uh, will be announced through my first internet providers and the second one will be uh, announced through other internet providers that, that I have well this is basically an utilization plan and reallocation plan well this this is basically the prefix that how that you are going to allocate to your to your equipment or to your network all will depend on on the way you request um, the resources as an internet provider or as an end user um, anyway um, probably it can make some confusion to you but um, we are open to clarify any doubts any point that you have um, fill in the form um, please do not hesitate to contact us um, I'm going to share my email, even at, uh, at the beginning of this presentation, my, um, our email is available there. You can contact us or even you can call us if you want to clarify any doubts about um, filling the form. Well, what about the fee? End uh, user, um, if they receive um, V6 and even V4 now, because we still have V4, um, the initial cost is 2,500. And then the membership fee is 600 per year. And remember that non-profit organization can get 50% of discount uh, in the initial cost and the annual cost. And internet provider, well, basically will depends on the, on the category and the amount of IPv6 that you, that you receive. But the smaller one is a slash, a slash 20. Uh, sorry, smaller one is last 32. That is a huge space, it's a lot of space. And this um, allocation put you in the small, small category uh, that the cost is 2,100 US dollars uh, a year. If you need more space, of, of course, you can get more than that um, according that uh, to your justification. Um, if you want or if you need more information about different category, you can click on the link that I'm sharing in this slide and well, you will find more information about different categories. Uh, that's all from my uh, side, Mariela. I'm not sure if the question will be now or at the end of the presentation of Alejandro. 
Yeah, yes, yes, Sergio, we have a, a question. Mm -hmm. The question uh, say, um, can the user ID be changed after creating the account? My current company is outside of LACNIC, but will be acquired by a company based in the LACNIC region in the next six months. I'd be requesting a, a slash 48. Okay, if I'm not wrong, there is there are two questions. Oh, well, one question, and then I I, I have a comment um, for for this for this question. Well, of course, yes, yes, it is completely um, manageable. You can um, change your user ID once you um, once we we allocate our, um, our resources to your to your company. V6 um, through the portal, you can administer the point of contact of your of your company or the technical contact, the billing contact, the membership contact. There are many kind of contact that you can manage, and and you mentioned something that that um, your organization is out of the Lagnir region, but you have customers or you are operating here. Um, if you request it, there are um, a requirement that. According to the to the uh, LACNI policy, your organization must be legally established in our region, in in, in here in, in in some country of, of of Latin America and Caribbean. So, what basically we are going to ask you some um, legal document demonstrating that your organization is legally registered in this in this region. This is just a comment that I want to share with you. Okay. Thank you, Sergio. You're welcome. Um, Alejandro, are you ready? Yes, I am, Mariela. Okay. Okay, let me try to share my presentation, please. Give me just a second. Sorry, Mariela, um, just a, a comment. Okay. Uh, that I didn't say. If 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 some of you have uh, some question, though, please don't hesitate to contact us at hostmaster at lagnic dot net. This is the um, email address that we uh, where we are um, supporting to everyone. Hostmaster at lagnic dot net. Yes, I I'm writing in in the chat. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Thank you, Marila. It's okay, Alejandro. Okay, perfect. So I guess that you can see my presentation in this moment. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, Sergio, for your presentation and Mariela, Mariela for your kind introduction. And well, I know that a lot of people from the Caribbean is in this webinar. I have to say that I hope that everything is okay in your sight because of the Hedorian hurricane. So my best wishes for all of you. Well, uh, I hope to spend the next 20 or 30 minutes talking to you about IPv6. In this case, it will be in the technical perspective. Let's start with a few basic things about IPv6. First, I want to say that IPv6 is not exactly a new protocol. It is a protocol that was developed back in 1998. It is defined by RFC, by the request for comment 2460, which is now 8200. So uh, it is a protocol that is over 20 years old. Uh, there are many reasons why IPv6 is not widely deployed. However, I have to tell you that in this moment, over 30% of the population in the internet is currently using and capable of doing IPv6, and over 17% in Latin America. So this is, a, this is today, in 2019, is a very used protocol. Uh, first thing that all of us we need to know, uh, it is written, or the, the format is based in 128 bits. Uh, if we take a look, that we're going to do it in the next slide, to the 
IPv6 header, we will notice that it is more simple packet. The format is, is more understandable. Actually, suppose you are a professor in the university, it, it is much easier to teach IPv6 than IPv4. I will tell you next. There is a concept of extension headers. Of course, you can manage in the same way as you do with IPv4, quality of service. Uh, the concept of IPsec in, is widely available in most devices. The concept of packet fragmentation does not exist, does not exist anymore, at least during the path. Okay, if you recall in IPv4, you had to fragment a packet whenever a smaller MTU, a uh, maximum transmission unit, was smaller than in the source. So the routers or the routers need to perform fragmentation, which is a very heavy task to do. Uh, since in this moment we have so many IP addresses, you do not need NAT network address translation anymore. So the end-to-end -end connectivity still exists. And I can tell you that because there is no NAT, uh, because the IP address is so big, in this moment it's very, very easy to have a network. Well, maybe not very easy, but it's easier than in IPv4. I want to recap a little bit about the format of the IP addresses. Um, in IPv4, you have a 32-bit length of addresses, which is roughly 4.3 billion addresses, which is not a big number. Uh, actually, the total population of the Earth is much more than that. And in this moment, you need several IP addresses per human being. And actually, today, as all of us know, the Internet of Things concept is taking space in our daily basis, and we need every day more IP addresses. Because actually the things like the lamp, the car, the, the refrigerator, and so on, are using IP addresses. Uh, now, with IPv6, you have 128 bits which is a very, very big number. As you can see, there are so many addresses per human being. Uh, some people compare uh, the IPv6 addresses with the amount of sand that exists in the Sahara Desert. So uh, there are so many. In this moment, we do not need to get worried about IPv6 exhaustion, as in IPv4, that we are very concerned about that now. And there is a topic that Sergio addressed in the previous section. Uh, talking about the way we write IPv6 addresses, I want to tell you that IPv6 addresses are divided in eight different groups. Every group has 16 bits. In the, I hope that you can see my cursor moving around the presentation. You can see that this is a group, this is another one, another one, another one, another one, another, another, and another, another. Every character is formed of four bits. Why? Because with four bits, you can write an hexadecimal digit. Every character of this that you can see is an hexadecimal digit. So you can see now a difference with IPv4, which is only decimal. In this case, it's hexadecimal. So having said that, every group has 16 bits. 4 plus 4 plus 4 and plus 4. So if you if somehow you try to move it to bytes, you have two bytes. There are very important things that we need to remember. For example, you have an IPv6 address in here. You can see which is very, very long. However, you can, you can use some tricks to represent it in an easier way to read, okay? Uh, before, before saying this, I would like to remember that you can, these letters can be either 
uh, lowercase or uppercase. So you can, it, it doesn't matter the way you write them. Uh, you can omit zeros, leading zeros is the concept. For example, the, here you, you, you have a leading zero here. You can omit this one. Actually, you do the same with IPv4. If you, for example, uh, recall the, IPv, the IPv4 address 1.1.1.1, there are two leading zeros, of course, on the left, uh, that you can omit when writing the, the IPv4 address. You can do it exactly the same with IPv6. In case you have a lot of continuous zeros on the, on the, IPv, on the IPv6 address, you can omit them and you can put two double columns in a row. There is an example uh, written here, 2001, colon, zero, dba, colon, zero, 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 dot, uh, column, zero, 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 13, OF, and more. Okay, so far, so good. What is happening in the, in the next IPv6 address? Actually, this one is the, is, is the same one. But look the difference. What happened? You have in the long example, 2001, column zero DB8. That's just fine. And in this one, you have 2001, column DB8 directly. They omitted, or we omitted, this character. So having written this is exactly at this. I have four zeros in a row. What I did, I just put one. It makes sense. It is exactly the same address. The same case here, four zeros in a row, the same here. 13 OF, 13 OF. I can do nothing to make this smaller, okay? However, in the next groups, we can see that we have four zeros in a, in a, in a row and four zeros one more time. What happened here, in the example we put, colon, colon, and the computer or the operating system is going, he will know that those eight zeros are suppressed and even when we, don't do not, we do not see it, they are actually here, okay? One for OB, one for OB, I can do nothing to compress this. However, uh, another difference that we can see here, another difference that we have in this example, I have capital letter here, and in this one I have lowercase. One more time, it is exactly the same IP V6 address. However, you might wonder why I could use colon colon to suppress these eight zeros in a row, why I did not do that in the previous zeros that were in a row. If I do that, it will generate ambiguity and the operating system won't know how many zeros I compress here or how many zeros are left in this part. So I can only use this type of compression once when I write an IPv6 address. Okay, let's move on. Uh, regarding how I write IPv6 addresses, I, I would like you to remember that there is a, like a new trend, but it has over 25 years, where I write IPv4 addresses using a format that is called CIDR, which means classless interdomain routing. So in IPv6, the concept of classes do not exist. If, if we recall IPv4, we used to have class A, class B, class C, and so on. In IPv6, that kind of things do not exist. I only write the IPv6 address, and then I put, I put the prefix size, which is like the mask in IPv4. However, in IPv6, the concept of mask does not exist anymore. In somehow, the, the concept remains, but the, the name, mask disappeared. Now the people call it prefix size, which is exactly the same. If you understood 
the mask in IPv4, that concept is exactly the same for IPv6. So do not panic about that. Here are some examples of how, some, I have an, a prefix here, 2001, colon, DB8, colon, 3003, colon, 2, colon, colon, slash 64. This 64 is like the mask, okay? Um, the global prefix is 2000 DB8, this part, which is slash 32. You can see that the prefix size is, is smaller for the global prefix. And in the prefix, of course, it is like a slash 64. Here happens something like a subnetting. The concept of subnetting still exists. What you did here, you had a slash 32 bits for the prefix length, for the prefix size, you turn on 32 bits more to have an slash 64. The subnet ID would be this part of the address, 3, uh, 3003, colon two, and this is the subnet ID. Regarding URLs, URLs you need to, to pay attention that now you need to use the when you're going to write IPv6 address, for example, in a browser, because you know the IPv6 address, you need to put them in a, in a bracket, okay, between brackets. Why? Because sometimes you need to divide, or you need to split the port number to the IPv6 address. And now that you used to use columns to do that, you cannot do that anymore because you use columns for dividing the groups inside the IPv6 address, okay? So the point here, the takeaway, please use brackets. I put an example of a browser, but suppose you're going to configure Apache as a web server, you need to, this concept remains, okay? Whenever you need to, to do something important uh, for IPv6 address where you need to manage the port number two and that kind of things, please put it between brackets. I need to tell you uh, that this kind of addresses, unicast, anycast, multicast, they still exist in IPv6. Uh, if for unicast, nothing new here, just in IPv4. One person communicates to other one. Anycast, uh, anycast is, a, is, is exactly the same as in IPv4. It's exactly the same, okay? Uh, but basically, it is a routing technique that is used. The anycast concept remains for IPv6. Multicast, uh, which is used in IPv4, but maybe not that, not as much as in IPv6. IPv6 is a power user of anycast. If you do not understand multicast, please review that. Pay attention to this to this concept. I want to tell you, and this is quite important, broadcast addresses don't exist anymore, okay? The broadcast disappeared in the IPv6 world. So never, ever in your life mention broadcast when talking about IPv6. Okay, now let's talk about the IPv6 header. Uh, let's recap. I will try to be brief with this. Let's, let's recap the IPv6 header the IPv4 header, before moving to the IPv6 header. And you will understand why IPv6 is much simpler. So I will try to, to do this uh, as slowly. However, if you have any question, please do not hesitate in asking it. I will be more than willing to respond to you. And in case I do not know the answer, I will try to, to figure it out. But please put any question that you have in the question and answer section. Okay, the IPv4 header, if you remember this header, this is actually what goes in the wire, what, what goes on the wire, the wireless signal is this. You have a version, uh, of course, when we're talking about IPv4, we traditionally write here IPv4 in, in binary. The, then you have something like it's called the header length. Okay, this is how much is the size of this header goes in here. You have another, another field, which is called type of service. In some uh, documentation, you will find this as a, as 
DSCP, which means differentiated service code point. But basically it's for type of service use, usage. Then you have another field which refers to the size of the packet, uh, total length. Okay, so far so good. Then you have another one which is called ID, which makes sense. It's like every time I send a packet, I will write a different ID for the packet. Then, then you have some flags in the field. Actually, you have here three different bits. One is a reserved bit, which traditionally is written in zero. Then you have two more flags, which are MF, which means more fragments. And you have another one, which is DF, which means don't fragment. Then you have another field, which is called fragment offset. Basically, this is a pointer. If the packet, for any reason, was fragmented during transit, I need to manage these flags turning, for example, the more fragment bit in ohm. I need to use a pointer in, in somehow to mention I fragmented this field and in the first packet I put 200 bytes and in the second one I, I had to put 100 bytes, that kind of things. I have to copy the ID for every fragment that I generated. Uh, actually, in the, there is a one more field here, which is called checksum. Uh, for checksum, I will need to calculate the checksum for every fragment, of course. So the, the fragmentation process, the point is, is very, very heavy. Then I have another field, which is in time to leave. Basically, it is how many hops, how many routers, how many layer three devices, the packet can go on. They have another field which is called protocol. The protocol field tells every device which protocol is going over layer three, IPv6 still being a layer three protocol. So uh, in IPv4 in this case, suppose you are transporting something, you are mentioning in, in the protocol field over me, goes UDP, TCP, ICMP version, ICMP, and so on. Then I have the checksum, which is somehow a mathematical calculation that is performed. And I wrote, and I have to write here 16 different bits, for example, 101110 is somehow, and the other end that is going to receive the, the, the packet, any layer three device, is going to perform uh, this very same uh, algorithm to calculate the checksum and it's going to write some numbers in there and of course should match perfectly. Then I have the source address and the destination address. Of course, all uh, both are 32 bits and, uh, and, uh, and additionally I have an options here which uh, of course are, <laughs> are not mandatory and I can, I can put in there whatever is needed. Okay. Um, okay, now let's move to IPv6. Uh, I have, it is a simpler IPv6 header. Uh, it's much simpler than IPv4. Why? Because it is a fixed size. It is always 40 bytes. In IPv4, the header can have different size. It is only twice bigger than the older version. Actually, sometimes it can be smaller. It is more flexible because it is able to manage extension headers. And of course, it's more, more, far more efficient than IPv4. Okay, I will go directly to, to this, okay? I want just to mention the current IPv6 header. I will mention every, everything that was in the previous slide. Things that are not here anymore, for example, you do not have anything that is related with fragmentation. If you can see, you do not have an ID for the packet. It is not needed anymore because fragmentation does not exist. The name of the fields are more explicit. For example, you have one which is called hop limit, uh, which was previously called TTL. But Time is not actually a good name for, for a packet. You do not know how much time it will live on the net. 
However, you in somehow you can know how, how much is the hop limit. For example, the protocol now it is called next header, which makes sense. What is the next header above IPv6? TCP, UDP, an extension header, something else. So it is much, much better. You still have, of course, the version, you still, you still manage a traffic class. You have a new field, this is 24 bits, called flow label. In this moment, it is traditionally written in zero. And you have IPv, IPv6 for source address and for the destination address, which of course is 128. Uh, for example, you can see that the header length is not here anymore. Why is it not here anymore? Because the header length is fixed. I know that it will be always 40 bytes, okay? So uh, this is the IPv6 header. Take a look to it. It is much simpler than in IPv4. If you're going to teach IPv6, you can do this in one hour. And for IPv4, maybe you need two days of class. Now, I want to talk about neighbor discovery. Okay. Uh, actually, this is the, the, the core of IPv6. If you, this is the last part of, of the webinar. If you do not understand neighbor discovery, there is something, something wrong, okay? You cannot deploy or troubleshoot IPv6, okay? Basically, what is neighbor discovery? I need to move here. What is neighbor discovery? Neighbor discovery is the replacement of, of several different functions that still exist in IPv4 that were improved for IPv6. For example, let's recap a few things that are mentioned in this slide. You have, for example, ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. If you remember ARP, this is the way where I know an IPv4 address and I need to identify the MAC address of the destination host. It is in IPv4. With neighbor discovery, this functionality, this feature is now improved and it works much better, okay? Um, for example, now you have, you can find routers that are in, in your network. You can detect overlapping addressing. This is something very beautiful. So there is a concept called duplicate address detection and more things, okay? Now let's talk about how everything works. First, I need you to know that neighbor discovery is actually a suite of different protocols. Actually, it's a suite of different features and all of them run over ICMP version six. ICMP refers, stands for Internet Control Message Protocol. In IPv4, it used to have a, it used to be a separate function. Now it is integrated. Uh, basically, you can see that we have five different messages. Okay, all of them are ICMP version six. If you recall the format of an ICMP v6, packet, which is identical to IPv, ICMP version 4, you have a type, you have a code, you have a checksum, and you have a payload. This is the type that is, will be transmitted depending on what I need. Okay, Every ICMP packet, in, when transmitting neighbor discovery, will, the hop limit will be set to 200, but will be set to 255. And it can contain this data or more. Uh, basically, I have this one is very important. Remember, this is the core of IP, IPv6. You need, if you really want to implement, deploy IPv6, you need to fully understand this. This one basically is the ARP replacement, the address resolution protocol replacement. How does this, how does this work? Host A is going to send a packet to host B. He's going to send a neighbor solicitation. It sends the packet to host B, which is basically ICMP version six packet, which is carried over IPv6, of course. It is the source address is A. The destination is multicast. So this is beautiful, no broadcast in this moment. My, my network is going to work better now because it is multicast. 
And the information that is over ICMP version six is my, actually my MAC address. This is called neighbor solicitation. The answer to a neighbor solicitation is a neighbor advertisement. I have source B here and sends a packet to A. Source B, destination A. One more time, ACMP version six, and the payload that goes over ACMP version six is my address. So this is like the answer, answer if we recall IPv4, of an ARP who has question. Okay? Now it is neighbor solicitation, neighbor advertisement. Now I have the router discovery. This is something quite funny and quite interesting because if you look the slide that is in front of you, there is a router. In this case, I have two hosts. This router is going to send frequently, probably around every five minutes, packets informing to everybody, I am here, I, I exist. There is a, a story that routers in IPv6, they feel so proud of being routers that they every time mention to everybody, hey, hello, I am here, I exist. What is going to happen? These devices are going to configure automatically their self because the router is going to send options, prefix, and much more information, and they can configure themselves automatically. There is no if I do not want, there is an option, but if I do not want to use DHCP, I still can have auto configuration, auto configuration in my network. And there is another one. This, uh, this is also neighbor discovery. This exists in, the, in IPv4 too. Maybe the people did, did, did not see it as much as in IPv6, but basically, I am not going to explain this in very detail unless you put it in question and answers. In this case, this computer can update the routing table automatically based in what the routers that are on the network inform to them. Suppose computer C needs to reach something that is behind router B. Instead of sending the packet to router A, it can send the packet to router B directly. And I can save bandwidth, CPU cycles, memories, maybe more resources. What is going to happen? Router A is going to tell, to send a packet to, router, to computer C, telling, hey, my friend, do not send me the packet to me. Send it directly to router B. And he will update the routing table. And the next packet that, where the destination is behind router B, will be sent directly to router B. And router A is not going to see anything. And for example, situations where, I, where asymmetric routing uh, is bad will be prevented because of this. <clears throat> I believe this is my last slide. Uh, I want to tell you that there is a mechanism called duplicate address detection where the host can prevent to use a, an address because it already exists in the network. Suppose my computer is just booting up and he wants to configure automatically one IPv6 address. It can detect before using that IPv6 address that that address exists in the network. If that is the case, I do not, I am not going to use that address and I, I am going to prevent duplicate addresses in my network, which is, of course, are very, very valuable. Um, this is all what I have, Mariela, uh, in case there are questions, I'm more than willing to answer. Yes, yes, Alejandro, we have a question. The question say, uh, what would be a good prefix size for a local network where we now normally use a slash 24 for IPv4? Ooh, this is a, a very good and thank you for that question. Um, I'm going to, to tell you basically the most common prefix size in, I, in an IPv6 network is a slash 64. 
So you are going to have a very, very big network space in your, in, in your local area network or whatever you're configuring, configuring that. Uh, and I fully recommend use, um, okay, sorry, let, let me start from, scar from scratch. The most common prefix size is a slash 64. Everybody is using that prefix size. You could use a smaller or larger prefix size. That is, of course, that is fully permitted and it is going to work. However, everybody is, is using in this moment a slash 64 because that is a way that everything is going to work. For example, the auto configuration mechanism that I mentioned many times during my presentation, most of the time only work if you have a slash 64 prefix. So if you want, for example, that mechanism to fully work, you need a slash 64. Suppose you have two routers and you want to connect them back to back, for example, you could try to use something smaller. For example, a slash 126, and your network will still function. Because in that case, since you are going to configure two different routers, there is a big chance that you want to use fixed address, static addresses, uh, configured in the interfaces of your routers. Okay, Alejandro, we have other question. Uh, what is the better prefix equivalent to a, a slash 30 for PTP? Can you read it? Okay, yeah, I got it. Actually, it was similar to what I mentioned at the end. Uh, I, I noticed that it, it was asked by Alberto Valderrama. Yes. Alberto, Alberto uh, generally speaking, what the people is doing in this moment, and actually that is my very same recommendation, is the following. Many people do not want to use a slash 64 for point-to-point -point links because there is like a feeling that you are going to lose a lot of IPv6 addresses, which is somehow makes sense. So what is the people doing in this moment? They reserve an a slash 64 for a point-to-point -point link but actually in the devices, the people is configuring a slash 127. To use one, a slash 127 in IPv6 is very popular because you do not need the subnet address, which many times was, you could not use a subnet address in IPv4. And of course, there is not a broadcast address. So if you use an slash 127, this is going to work with no worries. Okay, you can root between them, you can use link local address, something that I, I did not mention during this webinar. Uh, everything is going to work smoothly. Okay, Alejandro. Well, and it's the end of the webinar. Let me show the, the slides, please. Well, we have reached the, the end of the webinar and we hope you enjoy it. We will send in you the link with the recorded video of the webinar in the next few days. You can see our email on the screen for any question or comments, please. And for any question or comment, you must write uh, to training.lagnix.net. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you, Alejandro and Sergio. Uh, we say goodbye uh, to everyone and thank you very much again. Bye bye.